is both a writer and a computer scientist. He is the author of When Computers Were Human, uh, The Company We Keep, and other books on computing and the computing, uh, computing community. He's a third generation computer scientist. As his father, Thomas Greer, was an engineer at the old Burroughs uh, Computer Corporation, and his grandfather, grandmother, grand, oh, grandmother, excuse me. <laughs> Grandmother. That makes sense because her name was Blanche. Yes. Blanche O'Kane graduated from the University of Michigan in 1921 with a mathematics degree and was trained as a human computer, hence his book. Um, he's worked for computer manufacturers, taught computer science at George Washington University, consulted with startups, and uh, served as editor-in-chief of the IEEE. Uh, currently an associate professor at the Center for International Science and Technology Policy at George Washington University, and he also has a video channel that he says is really good. And <laughs> no, I say it's running. It's running, it's running. okay. Running. It probably is really good, though. But if you look at your book here, it gives you, the, it gives you that link to do that. He is the past chairman as of uh, December, December, January 1st of the IEEE Computer Society. And it's a great pleasure to have David Allen Greer come join us today. Well, thank you, Tom. I'm very pleased. I'm going to be talking about the convergence of the group of technologies here. And this talk is related to one of the breakout sessions that we just finished, which had breakout sessions, discussions on smart grid, on green ICT, transportation, and life science. So if you were not there, you're not going to get any of the jokes. Just go back for more dessert. It will be fine when it's over. Just, just be patient. For the rest of you, I was asked to talk about these technologies, and for some reason, I threw in the web of things, in part because I was talking with a reporter from the Wall Street Journal last week on what I thought was going to be a talk on the Internet of Things. It turned out to be on the web of things, which he said is much newer and much cooler than the Internet of Things. So people, we need to get caught up here. Um, it seems to me exactly the same thing with another layer of software. That's about it. But what I'm here to talk about are these technologies, and in fact, how the work of the IEEE, the Consumer Electronics Society, engineering as a whole, is pushing ideas together, that it looks like we are dealing with a great variety of activities and a great variety of technologies. And what's happening, in fact, is we are seeing engineered objects, consumer objects, things that you work on push society in a certain way and insert ideas that we have not seen before. And that process is making, is meaning that we're having just a tremendous impact over the last 20, 30 years on society. And means it's a very interesting time to be alive, a very interesting time to do the sort of work that you are doing. Now, I want to start this, though, before I get into those technologies, with what I'm going to tell you is the cautionary tale of three it's very sad, and you have to bear with us. You all are aware that we have this thing, 3D printing. It has become big in the last couple of years, last couple of months. And beginning about April, as president of the Computer Society, I started getting calls from reporters saying, give me a quote by 3D printing. And these were, first off, they seemed to be children. Um, second, they were excited. You could hear them panting over the phone. And they were saying, isn't this like the most wonderful thing you have ever, ever seen? And they would go through all the things that it would do for you. And the one that was my favorite was, when do you think 3D printers will be food? And I said, dearie, have you never had a business report? How do you think they make that? Um, they still didn't like it. They thought that this was some breakthrough and some activity that was making their lives meaningful and the world was changing. And they didn't realize, being the small children that they were, that they were part of what is called the pendulum of poorly grounded emotional response. If you are part of the Gartner group, you would call, call it the Gartner hype cycle. They have trademarked that. I can't use it. Besides, Gartner apparently has never read Young because it predates them. You introduce a new product, and people think this is good, and then it surges up to the peak of unreasonable enthusiasm, where people believe it's going to change the world as we know it. After about two weeks of playing with it, they begin to realize either, one, it's not going to change the world, or two, if it does, it's going to be hard. And then you plummet to the trough of unexpected disillusionment. 
At that point, the process recovers and things start to go again. So this is, as I said, the process that they were involved in and not really realizing that they were involved in. And I explained to them time and time again, so much so that no one ever used it. 3D printing is a form of numerically controlled machine tools. These have existed since the 1950s. When you show them that picture, they immediately lose interest. The plummet in the drop of despair. And the key thing to know is that these tools have changed our lives, have changed society. Everything that's in this room, including sadly the food you eat, the chairs, the tables, the video projectors, have been constructed with the help of these tools. And that they exist in a certain environment and they change that environment. Young reporters are never interested in these things, so it didn't go very long. And so I would say, let me tell you a successful version of a machine tool, of an American control machine tool. And that is the crown milling machine. Now, you people are maybe young and have not eaten enough sugar yet to destroy your teeth. But some of us have to every now and then go get a crown to a tooth. And you go to the dentist and they have a little machine that grinds it out and they plop it on and it's done. It used to be back in the old days, which is to say before about 1980, you had to go to uh, they did a mold, they sent it to some lab, it came back, it didn't fit, back and forth, back and forth. And what's interesting about this tool is it's a small, it costs a couple thousand bucks machine that fits neatly into the ecosystem of the dentist's office. That it's, you're dealing with a problem that's easily digitizable. The capitalization works very nicely. A single dentist can afford to finance it. It makes a big difference in the reduction of time and at some level of cost. And you're working with skilled workers who are used to working with equipment. And this is just another piece of equipment. And they figure it out. So this was a highly successful digital numerically controlled machine tool. One that was more of a failure, and again, reporters never care about this, you're supposedly changing the world, has been the numerically controlled sewing machine. These have been successful in industry, and the idea is that you can program a set of stitches in it that it performs as you're making a piece of clothing. And that there's a minor group of people in the United States that have used it for embroidery and other things. But it has not been the kind of success that Singer and the other sewing machine companies thought it was going to be in the 90s. And there are a bunch of reasons for it. The expense is not one of them. These things are now cheaper than standard mechanical sewing machines. So that isn't entirely it. It is for the first off, people are making fewer and fewer things at home. And those that do have a pride in their skill. And this is replacing one skill with another skill. And it's not a skill that you want to, to worry about. Now, I had a grandmother who was a mathematician who took great pride in the fact that she was. Most grandmothers I know are not that way. Very few grandmothers are interested in saying, I have truly mastered my numerically controlled sewing machine. They're much more proud of the fact that I can do the same stitches that my grandmother did and her grandmother did before her. So at the end of the day, I said, you know, for 3D printing, when they said, do you think it's going to change the world? I said, yes. But it's got to fit into society, and it's got to do it in a way that helps to change society, recognize its benefits. And there are four basic categories that you work in. The financial, the capitalization. Is it something that fits into a capitalized world that will work? And I pointed out, for example, one of the places where it's going to work are probably small-scale manufacturers where you need a lot of parts that you don't have to to store them all. And it makes sense to make them quickly rather than ship them. Again, that didn't really sit in. There has to be, there has to be an intellectual side of things. So you have to be dealing with something in which the parts, the projects, the manufacturing is digitizable in a way that we understand and that we can transmit those files and those processes across. And we know that probably CAD CAM is going to be deeply involved. There's a managerial side, and in particular the skill replacement process. You don't want to replace uh, trust and a loved hand skill with running a digital machine unless the other things work well, or that you have someone for whom that's part of their life. And then the last part I said is fitting into that great bigger organizational basis. It's something consumer electronics have had to do for years. When you bring out a new product, it changes the society around it. And since roughly the 30s, we have viewed 
consumer life is a fairly flat structure, that we can understand its desires and wants, skills and aspirations through a variety of statistical and sociological techniques. What we are seeing, particularly with the new applications, is a structure that changes that. That we no longer look at engaging it. We now look at building a structure in the consumer world and making that happen. One of the most recent examples were the two recent American presidential elections in which the Democrats organized their campaign around getting people to form groups that work together. This is something that is not widely understood in Washington. There is a group of people who believe that Obama fought the election. You won't go that way. And there's another one that believes that if the other side just got the right message, it would happen. It did some restructuring, how people interacted, how they worked with campaigns, how they worked with each other, how they worked with local political organizations. And that restructure is what consumer electronics does. And what's interesting are these new technologies, green ICT, the new transportation initiatives, smart grid. All of them are starting to restructure society as an information processing organization. And through that, producing a new society that we will likely not recognize 10 years from now. That kind of engagement happens on three levels. And it's the three basic levels that we've divided intellectually. A social level, where we are talking about hierarchies and laws and democratic structures, and how do we break those apart, remove hierarchies that are not functioning, and replace it either with a democratic crowdsourced, if you will, structure, or a looser, more flexible group. All of them, you can see, have market structures in and are using markets in new ways to get people to organize themselves in different ways. And the last is the psychological dimension. How do you get new norms, new concepts, new ways of thinking about yourself and the world to create a new society and to operate differently? So that leads to what I'm referring to as the change the world thesis. We are living in a time, and we have been part of a time, that is truly restructuring societal organizations in very profound ways. We have people of which some are in this room, or are people that you know, or that are organizations you work for, that are very interested in changing relations of power, of status, of function, of activity, of relationships, in ways that allow society to do things that it couldn't do before. Hopefully things for the better, but we shall see as history judges us. Let's start with the smart grid. If we look at the various pieces here and go through those four steps, the capitalization, clearly right now there is it's such a big problem, such a big activity, the capitalization can absorb a lot of technological change. And certainly in the three big areas of generation, transmission, distribution, we're breaking those things apart and trying to deal with them in new ways and in more efficient ways. There's clearly uh, a fair amount of knowledge that has already been heavily engineered. It's run by skilled people, and you can structure it to run the grid better, better, to make it more efficient, to get power where you need it, when you need it, and also that there are a fair number of skills in that running of it, that you're not replacing one with another. It's going to fit into that ecostructure. But what's it going to do to the greater society? And that's part of the issue. Again, we think of when you use electricity as being part of a consumer base. You're out there, you do nothing except take the electricity and use it. And that is the standard structure of consumer life. In fact, one of the things this is doing is deploying those economic models, the basic markets, to get people to do things differently, to act differently, to use electricity when it's cheap, to plan it so that uh, they can use it better, to perhaps become a generator. One of my dear friends, who I wrote up about many times in computer magazine, dug the rocket scientist because, well, his name was Doug, and he actually was a rocket scientist. He went out, bought a bunch of solar cells, slapped them down on his roof, and quickly realized that most of the time he generated more power than he needed and had to go negotiate with Glendale, California, to put his power back into their grid because they weren't ready for this yet. But it's starting a process of new organizational engagement through market mechanisms. 
Well, that's not the only part. We have over <coughs> the issue of dealing with smart grids a long history of thinking about how you uh, aggregate demand, how you work with groups, and how you think of it. Samuel Lynch, who was a member of the IEEE, I believe he was actually president for two years at the start of the 20th century, set the pattern of how you gather data, and data seems to be important, and how you apply that to his control. He would not have little doubt, look, 20, look 100 years ahead, and think about what's going on and say, yes, that follows some of the ideas I have. But one of Insull's contemporaries wrote what is probably the most famous, or at least the most story, essay on electrical engineering, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1916. They postulated that electrical grids were breaking up, they were shattering society, because they were turning people from a group who congregated and used things they knew to using things they did not know. And I think now 110 years since that, we are asking the same thing. Do we know what we're using for our customers and what they're using? And will these markets help them use it better? Will it change the way they think about their relation to utilities, to technology, and to the energy itself, as well as to each other? Well, from that, we go to transportation. And whenever I do a talk on transportation or reference it, I use that picture. Do we have anyone, please, in this hall who recognizes it? Golden Tower of the Fisher Building, Grand River and the Third, Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan was, to the mid-80s, the richest city in the world. It had more PhDs per capita than any other city in the world, more engineers per capita. The median wage of every class of individual was higher than anywhere in the world. And we know where it is now. There has been a structural change that its organization, the organization of that city, could not grasp. And there are, there are many places to point blame. It's not any single, single, single group. But the fact that manufacturing <coughs> could move, and that it could be automated, or at least partially automated, and done cheaper in other parts, and done cheaper closer to different markets, made it uh, mark the end of the city. We're now looking at a self-driving car and similar kinds of automated transportation systems. We have some experience with innovation, and we know that this is related to other kinds of smart initiatives. But what's going to happen in terms of restructuring or rethinking society? I think there is an economic side to it, but I also argue that this is going down one of the other paths much more strongly. The capitalization of the transportation central the economy. There is money there, there are a lot of ways we are going to be able to move smart systems into our economy. The knowledge. We know a lot about computerized cars and computerized driving. This is the Carnegie Mellon test car of about two or three years ago. We also now have on conventional automobiles standard um, information backbones, standard sensors. There's a lot of things that have gotten us one step or two steps away from starting to deploy smarter technologies. So that's not going to be the problem. Skills replacement within the workforce. That could be. And it has been once in the automotive industry. We gave up mechanical controls on the automotive industry in the United States in 1980. It was roughly a six year period. Um, Gerald Ford signed the legislation in uh, 1974 that forced the change towards electronic controls. The auto industry kicked its screen for two years. So it really didn't get started until 78, 68, 76. 77 saw the first couple of cars coming out, and then in 80 was it. It ended the career of the entire generation of mechanics. Men who had been changed in trains, largely in World War II and Korea, in mechanical controls, discovered they couldn't learn it, and they were flipped out very, very quickly. A few of the younger ones were retooled. But it was a complete turnover. Then in Detroit, in particular, presaged the start of the decline until 1980. So there's something that may be there, but again, this is electronics. Electronics are part of it. It may not be the kind of impact that we think. It's the organizational impact. It is, in many ways, those things: position, status, 
function, the three sociological variables that determine a group. What is going to happen, in particular, what's happening to the role of the driver? We heard, and there are no jokes that I can offer on this one, sadly, in our breakout session, that that's an issue that we now organize cars, we design and engineer them, to <coughs> minimize the influence on the driver, to make sure the driver is not touched by outside noises and other distractions. What happens when they don't need to drive or drive less or drive in a different way? Well, we're starting to see some things that suggest that we may be willing to accept that kind of change. In particular, the urban classes of people in their 20s are buying cars less and less. They have alternative of cars to rent by the hour. And we've already seen studies that suggest their driving skills are not as good as those six and eight years old because they're just not driving as much. So there may be a shift now that we can look at this thing in a sociological structure and say, all right, the time has come to restructure the function and position of the driver. And that will be changing because anyone who has seen you know, the old movies from the 50s and 60s where driving was new and was exciting. And even through the 90s, it retained a certain power that seems to be lost. And we may be at the point of this technology pushing that position in a very different direction. Life sciences has all of those as well. It has the economic issues. Now, when we talk about life sciences initiatives to this group, there's a lot of things going on. There are uh, health care basically at home. The point of care can move now out of a hospital and out of a doctor's office into your home into other places. Electronic medical records are clearly a big part of it. Various forms of uh, telemedicine. And one of the things to remember is that this is connected to the other initiatives in a common way. Doctors are expensive. Medical records are expensive. Hospitals are expensive. It's a way of sharing an expensive resource like smart grid is a way of sharing an expensive infrastructure. And smart cities, in many ways, one of the key things are how do you share, how do you get a group of people to share a point on the earth where a great deal of wealth is generated. But the more people you get there, the more expensive it becomes to live, to navigate, to work, to live. So all of these are that process. So that, those are often economic models. And we, we already have some experience about things that are happening. I can pull back to the dentist tool. When you bring these things to start making things smaller, being able to focus on point of care, and to be able to share assets. Now, capitalization, that's clearly a problem that's not that difficult to get here because medical care is somewhat independent of economics. We all have reached points where we will pay anything to do something, to get health care back. Knowledge, that's going to be a bit of a challenge, and I particularly saw this, I've been reminded of it, having gone to dentists a couple of times in the last year, because my dentist was one of the early adopters of this, and she is very proud of the fact that she was an early adopter. But again, we are now turning out new dentists who have digital skills, and that's not going to be as big an issue. The skill replacement, um, and I'm flipping things over, that was the skill replacement I just talked about. The knowledge. When you're dealing with teeth, there's a lot of digitalization of records. There's not an ID problem. We know how to digitize teeth and dental records. Um, again, the skill replacement, I don't think, is going to be a big thing because we are already turning out the swords. What's the interesting thing in life sciences, <coughs> and it's something that we often don't see, is the organizational equation. Medicine has a privileged place in society, and that place changes from society to society. And the kind of medical structures, medical institutions that you have in the United States are not repeated anywhere else. The ones that you have in Europe have some similarities, but have a different time to governance. Those in Japan are very different. They have different responsibilities and different rights. There's a strong cultural component that is very hard to move. And there are a set of psychological norms, standard ways of thinking and behaving that do not transfer across cultures very, very easily at all, even within different subcultures of the United States. We, that cultural dependency has made us have certain expectations of doctors, 
certain understandings of our role as patients, and certain understandings of how medical knowledge is generated, passed from family to family, and can be utilized. We need to, if uh, we're going to be expanding the life sciences, we really need to view this, really everything, as a global activity. If we are expanding these technologies, we have to look at the widest possible market. And that means getting over some of these problems and getting over the cultural norm, I think are going to be some of the hardest ones that we have to face. Now I have this picture here. Lydia Pinkham's herb medicine is a, a common cure that was sold about 100 years ago. We have had in the United States some experience with changing. We went through two legislative acts, the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act and the 1910 Flexner Report of Medical Education that radically changed the norms of medicine in the United States and focused on the common set of institutions that the United States now has. Prior to 1910, there was a huge subclass of women doctors who dealt with babies, pregnant mothers, and dying old people. A traditional women's task, but it was a role for them. We tolerated large swaths of alternative medicines that did not use chemistry, or sold cocaine tooth drops. That'll fix any problem you have with your teeth. Trust me. They cause some other problems, but you never quite felt as good as you can when you have a cocaine tooth drop. Uh, but some of those things are subtle. The medical community talked about the right of self-medication and how much did we as patients have that right and what limits were there on the right on that right of self-medication. Who regulated medical production? And in particular, the Flexner Report changed that radically. It put an end with lots of medical schools that did it. But in particular, it centralized medical knowledge at universities and teaching hospitals. There's a phrase that we now use largely, almost exclusively, in a derogatory way, old wives' tales. Prior to 1910, the bulk of medical knowledge were cared for in women, largely mothers. Largely older mothers who had seen children and family grow, who had gotten knowledge from their parents and learned it not largely by observation. And it wasn't that they were any particularly less scientific than people in hospitals. They hadn't been trained as much, and sometimes there were issues that they saw that they watched and they disciplined as only mothers can. And one of the activities of this period, 1906 to 1930, was to discredit the medical knowledge of women. And in the process of changing how we're dealing with medical diagnosis, with medical treatment, to the extent that we move it at home, we're being asked to do that again. And the exact direction we're going to go is not at all clear. And how much authority we have over our own health is going to be very, very different. We didn't talk about the web or internet of things in our session. I somehow thought we were going to. I think this is another piece that's important. The web of things is basically what we all call the Internet of Things, but some more software so that you can query sensors and gather data and put them together. I think this is primarily a supportive technology, but being a supportive technology like the Internet, it's going to underline a whole set of institutions and a whole set of activities, and it's going to affect those three categories of how we deal with things, the economics, the psychology, the sociology. And each of those will be twist to create new institutions and new ways of organizing our life. I think in many ways green ICT is another. First off, I think within just a few years, all ICT we will call it is green because there's so much power being used for it that we need to figure out how to minimize that. Uh, this is the 10 2 computer from China, the one that was recently named the um, top, the fastest computer in the world on the top 500 list. I also need to tell you that it no longer exists. I was at the Chinese Computing Federation Conference in Changsha, where it was, and I told my handlers, oh good, I get to see the 10 v 2 No, we've taken it apart. It's now six computers distributed around China. <coughs> well, <coughs> they come and they go again. But we really can't sustain it. With, it's a horribly in terms of power, horribly inefficient. The one thing that I rarely hear discussed in the ICT is 
solid disposal. And I think that's another issue we need to discuss because it actually points to a bigger thing. There are four or five major high-tech junkyards in the world. The biggest one is in Nigeria, there's one in southern China, there's one in Indonesia. And they're horrible places, they're messy places to work. And junkyard work is not good under the best of circumstances, but it's leaving a mark of what our industry has done. And I don't think we really want to do that. But the other thing that it points to is we understand now supply chain in a way that we never understood before because of all the models we've done and the data we can collect. We have not done the same for disposal chains. And the time is to look at that. That will uncover a group of new kinds of workers, a new kinds of social structures, and new things that need to be transformed and optimized. So this is where we are. Capitalization, knowledge base, and skill set. Do we have the pieces there and how do we use those? to build new products, build new services, and what impact do those three have on society? That device there is Google server number one. It's on display at the Smithsonian right now. Um, those are some of my students and a couple passers-by who didn't know that they were getting a picture taken, and so I probably not using their picture legally, but be that as a thing. Um, we know what Google has done in terms of restructuring our lives, connecting us with people around the globe, connecting us with information that we did not have easily accessible, allowing us to move with greater strength in smaller groups, and allowing the small groups to be highly effective as businesses, as nonprofits, as artists, and as advocates. One of the parts of the last part is organizational engagement which is the last little bit of this talk that I wanted to bring out. We are now seeing consumer electronics that are overwhelmingly based on software, that the engineering structure is now split very clearly into two pieces, optimizing the electronic or hardware section, and then making the functionality out of it come from software. It has restructured electronics fundamentally. And what's fascinating is that software engineering, of which I have a computer society been the spokesperson for for last year, has its intellectual roots completely outside of electrical engineering. The connection between it and electronics is almost nil. It borrowed everything from production management. And production management has moved in, it's sort of production management has moved in a lot of different things. It's moved in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. This is, of course, Frederick Winslow Taylor, one of the founders of it. And one of the things that he argued was that in production, in efficient production, you split work and intelligence. Leadership, planning, direction, judgment from the physical force that does the work. Prior to his time, prior to 1910, you could already see hints of a change. He did not invent this concept. But certainly you go back a half century before, and the shop steward had much more power than shop students have now, that they contained most of the knowledge in an organization, that they did most of the planning, and that they were largely untrained, that they trained as apprentices. Software engineering has, at some level, brought that to a lot of different activities. It has split leadership from work. Now, in so doing, it has benefited all of us. There are a number of things that we no longer do because we don't have to because we can rely on the leadership of others. I'm sure if I put up my hand and says, who balances the checkbook every month? Then we're not going to get a lot of hands because we know we've got a bunch of systems that double check. Yet when I was a young man, as I'm sure many of them, the rest of you when you were young people, <coughs> except those of you that are still young, were taught you have to keep track of your own money because if you don't, you won't have it. And that was one of the pieces of it. So we all benefit from it because it spreads the workload around us. But it does make the demand of how do we identify leadership in ourselves, in others, in groups around us, and how does that leadership join together to shape a stronger society. And as we look at those things, we are going to get a new society emerging. It's going to be, I suspect, hyper-local because it empowers people to use what skills they have and to join it with small groups of others to get it done and to push the work that they aren't interested or willing or able or desirous of doing. 
outside. And with these different structures, we're bringing that kind of idea, not only to our world, it's affecting everything we do in our organizations, but to everyone outside of this conference and everyone outside of this conference facility in the world. That's the kind of impact that's happening. That's the forces that are bringing things together. And that's why we are here today, to talk about this with each other, to see about where we are going, and to, to lead it, or to help it, or to help people understand what's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you.